Hi there, Biology 400. This is Mr. Workman, and this is going to be your screencast session two for exploring the cellular basis of life. As you begin uh, viewing the screencast, make sure that you have your uh, unit booklet. Uh, that's going to be the one with the blue cardstock cover that says Exploring the Cellular Basis of Life on the front cover. Specifically for this screencast presentation, you're going to be viewing, it uh, looks like pages 41 through 44. Um, so let's get to it here. Um, excuse me there, let's look at this. As you, as you look at this diagram here, ladies and gentlemen, what you're seeing are two cartoonish or schematic representations of two very different types of cells. We're going to uh, talk about the similarities and the differences between those two types of cells in screencast session three. As you look at this screencast, you have three particular learning targets. As a result of viewing this screencast, you should be able to explain why cells need to be small. Uh, why they're not big is another way to think about that target. Target two, you need to be able to calculate in general what we call a surface area to volume ratio. And number three, you need to uh, know some of the strategies, strategies or some of the ways that um, cells uh, avoid the surface area to volume issue that they can have um, if they get too big. Alright, so let's get into this. Um, this same diagram, you see this diagram on page 41 in your unit booklet. Of course, you're seeing it here in color. And what I would like to point out to you right now is that cells are pretty small things. As you look at this scale of uh, items, obviously at the bottom of this diagram we have the tiniest objects and at the top of this diagram we have the larger objects. And each uh, mark on this scale is it represents a tenfold or it's a factor of ten increase or decrease depending on whether or not you're going down this diagram or going up this diagram. And you can see that cells are pretty small relative to the size of a human. Some of our cells like nerve cells or muscle cells can be rather uh, large but most of them are actually really small. And if you look at tiny little bacterial cells they're smaller than the cells that you and I have. As we look at these what we call micrographs over here on the right hand side of the diagram or the right hand side of the slide here this is a scanning excuse me the top one here is a transmission electron microscope uh, photograph we call it a transmission electron micrograph and this one down here at the bottom is a scanning electron micrograph. These are images of the microvilli uh, structures in the inside of your small intestine and the whole purpose of um, these finger-like projections, or these microvilli as we call them, are to increase the surface area inside your gut. I don't know if you knew this, but the inside of your small intestine, the total surface area on the inside of your small intestine is about the same amount as a full tennis court. Uh, and you need a lot of surface area inside your small intestine so that you can absorb a lot of hydrolyzed uh, molecules into your bloodstream. And the more surface area there is, the greater the absorption rate that can happen and the more efficient your body is at taking nutrient molecules from your digestive tract into your blood. So we have this issue of cells being small and what that generally means is that to have a big organism you need to have a lot of cells. Let's talk about why uh, fundamentally cells need to be small though. And as you think about this idea, what I want you to realize is that you have this same diagram on page 42 in your unit booklet, and I'd like you to look at this diagram and more specifically look at these numbers on the chart below it. But what you should see in general uh, is that this is a little cube here, and let's say that the side of this cube, uh, the length of the side or the length or the width or the height of this cube would be 1 the unit doesn't matter, let's call it one centimeter, one millimeter, it doesn't matter. And compare that to this cube which is larger and the length of the side of this cube is five. And I think you can pretty much tell that the volume of this cube would be greater than this cube. The surface area amount on this cube with the side length of five would be greater than the surface area amount on this cube. But I want you to realize is there's a proportion here that we need to think about. If you think about this small little cube, which is cube A, and compare that to cube B, 
what I want you to realize is that the proportion of surface area relative to the amount of volume, uh, there's actually a higher proportion of surface area in the smaller cube than there is in the larger cube. For example, if you were to take this cube and chop it into 5 times 5 times 5, that's 125 pieces, right? Um, what you're going to see is that the total volume of all of these pieces is equivalent to the total volume here. But if you think about all these new facets or these new faces that have been cut to making you know, this cube sliced into all these little cubes, over here we have a lot more surface area. But the total volume of this uh, cluster of cubes is the same as the total volume of this one cube. So we have this idea that the larger an object is, the lower the amount of surface area proportional to its volume. And contrasted, um, and, and in converse, we can say that the smaller an object is, the greater amount of surface area it has relative to its volume. The whole business of cells is to make stuff and then get that stuff out of the cell. And to make that stuff, raw materials need to be brought into the cell. And the only way to get stuff into or out of a cell is for that material to cross the phospholipid bilayer membrane. And so to make that process efficient, cells need to have a high volume, excuse me, I said that backwards, a high surface area relative to their volume in order to do that process efficiently. And so resultantly, if you just look at this mathematically, cells need to be small in order for that volume, uh, surface area to volume ratio, uh, to remain favorable. And you can look at these numbers, and we're going to go through these numbers in class probably to make sure that you understand this. But right now what I'd like you to do is find um, page 43 in your unit booklet, and I'm going to go to this and help you do a little bit of math right here. Just to explore this idea. Now this, dia this uh, document does have a web link on it. Um, notice this is, page, this is page 43 in your unit booklet. And what we're going to do here is do a little bit of surface area calculation and then compare that to a volume calculation. Now um, please recall that the surface area of any square, and a cube is a six-sided object that all the faces are square, uh, the surface area, the area formula for a square is length times width, or height times base, or however you want to think about it. So for example, if we were to look at a cube that has six sides, and each side measures one centimeter, what we're going to do is multiply the length times the width on each side, and then multiply that by six sides. And so if we were to figure out the surface area of a cube that has one centimeter on a side, the total surface area would be six centimeters squared. One times one times one, excuse me, one times one for one centimeter squared multiplied by six, total of six square centimeters. The volume of a cube is going to be the length times the width times the height, and that's going to be one centimeter times one centimeter times one centimeter. And so the volume of a cube that has one centimeter sides is one cubic centimeter. And what I want you guys to focus on right now is this number proportionate to this number. And that proportion is 6 to 1. Now what we're going to do is do the same calculation for a cube that has 2 centimeters on a side. So let's do the surface area calculation first. Each side is going to be 2 centimeters multiplied by 2 centimeters, which is going to mean 2 times 2. Each side is 4 square centimeters, or 4 centimeters squared. If I multiply that by 6 sides, 6 multiplied by 4 is 24 square centimeters. Let's do the volume now.
two centimeters on a side, and we're going to do length times width times height. So what I'm going to do is two centimeters multiplied by two centimeters times two centimeters. Two times two is four. Four times two is eight. So that's eight cubic centimeters. Now if we look at this proportion, 8 and 24, our ratio diminishes. The ratio of surface area to volume is going to be 24 to 8. And you know, if you want to get the lowest base ratio, what we can do is say that um, this is 3 to 1. 8 times 3 is 24. So. Three to one. And what I want you to notice is as the cube got larger, the ratio of surface area to volume becomes less favorable for the cell. Let's see if that trend continues with a three centimeter on each side cube. Three times three equals nine square centimeters. Multiply that by six sides. Nine times six, oh, let's see, what's that? That's 54. Okay, volume is going to be three centimeters times three centimeters times three centimeters. That's the length, the width, and the height multiplied. Three times three is nine. 9 times 3 is 27. So now look at our ratio here, 54 relative to 27. The surface area to volume ratio is 54 to 27. Now 27 times 2 is 54. So the actual lowest proportion is 2 to 1. So we have a trend here, and I want you to continue this. And the trend here is that if the cube-shaped cells were to increase in volume, the surface area grows. But the thing is, is the surface area is a square function. Volume is a cubic function. So what's going to start to happen is as the size of the cell gets bigger, the surface area to volume ratio gets less favorable for cells to move materials in and out of that cell. Now, so what happens if cells get big? Well, they have a variety of strategies, and this is page 44. Um, cells can employ a variety of strategies to um, combat the um, inefficiencies of becoming bigger. And the simplest solution is obviously to say stay small. We have a variety of solutions here. Um, some types of solutions are actually geometric solutions. And some shapes are going to have a greater surface area to volume ratio. A sphere is actually a relatively bad shape for surface area to volume proportion. And so cells will drawn out into a cylinder shape or a rod shape or maybe even a flat disk shape. That actually helps with the surface area to volume proportion. Another strategy is to fold the surface of the membrane. Instead of just staying as a simple cuboidal shape or a spherical shape, cells will actually have this folding of the membrane and have these pseudo-feet or pseudopods, as we call them, pseudopodia, um, extending out and changing the shape so that the, the surface area to volume ratio proportion uh, improves. A cell can hollow out its center, like to have a big, huge bubble of water in the middle of a plant cell is a common strategy for plant cells to employ. If a cell is going to be big but not employ these shape um, strategies um, to increase its ability to gain materials or nutrients, a cell can actually go out and look for uh, materials that it needs. So if it makes itself mobile, if it has some way to move around, in a watery environment, cells can get bigger 
because they don't need to just sit there and absorb nutrient materials through uh, molecule exchange across the membrane. Some um, cells that are single-celled organisms actually that um, go out and hunt for their food, they actually actively surround their food materials and um, instead of just uh, molecule exchange, they actually envelop or in, uh, engorge themselves with their food material. Um, <clears throat> some cells have a way of actually moving nutrients within themselves. Um, they have this mechanism for moving materials around and actually we'll see this, this cytoplasmic streaming when we look at live LOD cells, this unit. Now there's also different ways that cells can employ their strategy for life in that some cells will have multiple different organelles to divide the types of labor or do specialization of task for different types of organelles and that just helps in general with the types of nutrients that the cell needs in different spots. And then different cells can actually specialize in different um, specialties themselves so they you know, this is within a cell if you look at different organelles, and this is division of labor between different types of cells. So um, some types of cells are for transport, and some other types of cells are for nerve, you know, electrical conduction, and some other types of cells are for making hormones or what have you. Um, so these are a variety of strategies, and you can read more about these as um, you have time on page 44. So that's it today. Uh, hopefully you learned something um, as you go back to this. Um, well, let's go back to the right slide. Sorry. We're auto recovering there. Hopefully now you can explain why cells need to be small. It's all about the surface area to volume ratio to make them efficient at moving materials into uh, cells or out of cells. And just in general, how you can calculate surface area to volume ratio or proportion, and then know some of the strategies or ways in which cells can avoid the surface area to volume ratio problem. And details for target three, of course, are on page 44 in your unit booklet. That's it for now, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next time.